All right, let's welcome our next presenters, Scott McGowan, CEO with Kestrel Aerial, and Kelly Watt, CEO with Visual Plan. Hi, everybody. How are you? I'm Scott McGowan. Uh, this is Kelly Watt. Uh, this afternoon, we wanted to uh, kind of dive into digital twins. Uh, and one of the main reasons that, that I personally am involved in it is I've been in the drone business for about 10 years. Uh, we've, we've found as we've kind of moved and evolved as an industry that it's really much more about data collection. The drones are neat, but they're merely a uh, platform that we use sensors to collect the data. And as we move into more of a data-driven world where uh, there, there are more advances in, in what we can collect, how we can collect it, and how accurate it is, uh, the software side is becoming more and more popular and more important as well because now we need to take all that data that we're collecting and figure out, you know, what is it that the client needs to see in a deliverable and how can we help move technology along. So I want to introduce Kelly Watt with Visual Plan and Kelly is somebody that is, is really one of the leaders in kind of taking some of the new ways of collecting data like with 360 uh, cameras and, and using lasers and bringing that into a world that can help be proactive with many of the programs that involved uh, inspections and essentially looking at, at what your assets are, how they're diminishing over time, and then how you can take that actionable data and use that in machine learning to make decisions that eventually lead to AI once you have enough data sets that can, that can be compiled to make that actionable. And then that way you can look at your programs and, and be more proactive about it rather than reactive. So, Kelly? So my, name is, my name is Kelly Watt. Thanks for having me today. Um, my background's in terrestrial LIDAR. Um, I ran the global uh, division for Ferro Technologies. You may be familiar if you're working with uh, terrestrial-based LIDAR. Work with Trimble Navigation in the past, and, and really, you know, kind of always been hearing, is there a faster, better way to document our existing conditions of our facilities and assets? And, you know, it really kind of took me leaving Ferro and doing consulting in the, in the world where I kind of really, really kind of glimmed into this 360 world and, and like, what's possible? Like, I can walk around with a hard hat and I can capture 300, 500,000 square feet of data outdoors in a day. Or I can do 100,000 square foot of facility data in a single day. And not just have imagery, but have those in a 3D environment that I can measure, I can annotate, I can compare, I can use for various purposes. So. I think everyone's probably tried to stab at defining what a digital twin. I'm going to take the definition directly from the Digital Twin Consortium, which is a group I'd, I'll uh, encourage you guys to do a little uh, digging into. It's a group of uh, industry professionals and, and technology companies that are kind of better defining how do we use digital twins, what does it mean. And you know, I think a lot of digital assets, like a BIM, people think that's a digital twin. And, and really, our definition of a, a digital twin is all of those types of assets brought into processes that they're used to look at historical and, and current information to make good decisions. Uh, so that's kind of the context we're gonna talk about digital twins. I'm gonna put a claim out there, and we've heard this from facility operators, and we deal with a lot of facility operations people, is you know, can we remove the site visit, and how does that impact an organization, especially in oil and gas when you have OSHA training and, and just the, the, uh, the problems getting on site and then the health and safety risk of being on site. So if we can remove people from the field and do things digitally, and we're gonna show some case examples, we're seeing some significant benefits from that, what does that mean to the organization? Um, so this is kind of a dashboard showing a, a basic screen. It's module-based. In the center, we have a 360 uh, image of a pump. Uh, you have your, uh, your as-built drawing there in the center, and it's kind of cut off a left, uh, on the left side. That, that digital form can be created uh, and customized any way we like. So this was an integration we did with IBM Maximo for uh, bringing a digital twin into a CMMS system. So what we're doing is going through, uh, capturing the data, there's like a three-story pump room, took maybe three, four hours with a, with, a, with a tripod, and then going and tagging each of the assets, filling out the asset attribute information, and you'll see there's a link right to the CMS uh, at the bottom there. Uh, so you can click on that and actually open the exact asset record in the IBM Maximo and see all the work order history. So it's really a kind of looking at different ways to merge digital twin technology into operational processes where you know, work order systems are not very visual, right? And you know, financial asset capital planning teams, they never actually get on site to see these things. So uh, the better we can do to show people what the, uh, what the asset looks like over time, recapture that information, and track that, that, that operational change that happens every day on, on sites, if we have a fast and effective way to do that, then what does that mean to the organization? 
So this is uh, an MEP room kind of walking through. On the left-hand side, you have folder structures. That's how the organization uh, manages their assets, and each one of those folders are, are numerous assets. So I think we have probably about 300 assets uh, just listed in this particular uh, facility. And we can kind of search and find those quickly and have att attribute information, operate manuals, and, and, and whatnot. So you know, having that searchable, having it visual, having current conditions, I know at that specific date and time, that's exactly what it looks like. It, it allows us to be more efficient when we do go out to site. Uh, we know what we're dealing with, right tools, right filters, belts, all that kind of stuff. And, and this is a, a really cost-effective process to implement into an operational uh, preventative maintenance kind of strategy, right? So even with these boilers here, we'll have the operator manual there, uh, which will open up and we'll actually be able to thumb through the operator manual. So it, it doesn't matter what kind of data that we want to attach here, uh, whether it be PDFs or Excel sheets or pictures or documents, uh, we're referencing them geospatially specifically to those assets, and that's what makes it special. Uh, and then really what this, what this looks like in IBM Maximo is just really a, a URL. That's all it is. It's a deep link that goes to this complex facility, but it goes precisely to that location so know where I am. So, you know, that's, we're kind of doing the, a lot of the indoor capture, but we're also exploring uh, drones uh, and using the 360 and drones, and that's where Scott's been really kind of innovated and, and you know, kind of trying some different things, different cameras, and, you know, we are stitching that image through machine learning, so none of this is hand-placed. Uh, which is a really critical thing, and we're also getting measurable data out of this as well. Certainly not LIDAR measurement, but reference measurement. So, you know, in a facility like this, maybe a half inch to an inch, which is certainly good enough for a lot of what we do. And then kind of getting into tagging this information and put QR codes on that, so, so someone can come up, hit that with their phone, and be able to be directed to a software that, again, you have to log in to gain access, but you can be uh, having that information in your hands right away. So when we look at preventative maintenance, there's like a tenfold savings if you're not living in this break it, fix it world. And to be able to do proper maintenance, you need to be able to create repeatable processes. And you need to know precisely where your assets are and what condition they're in. So here's an application for leak detection and repair. The, the key part here is to tag all the assets locations and to have those documented, we actually brought the inspection process directly into the annotation. So now, a very junior person can go to site with an iPad, will know exactly where all the valves and pumps are located, work from the top to the bottom, make sure they don't miss anything, and put in actual variables that they're uh, collecting in the field. It could be thermal imagery or other things. And also, you know, one of the, one of the other uses uh, that you can use drones on these kind of sites is using optical gas cameras to do methane or other VOC detection. But one of the issues you have is if you're in a large facility and you're getting hits from your camera and you're, and you're trying to document those, how to, how to have crews actually figure out how to find where, you know, where's that valve that's leaking, where's that pipe that's leaking, where is the issue on a, on a very large facility, it's great to be able to import that into a software like this where they can literally, you can have the annotation as to where you actually found the leak and then they can go into a virtual software like this and they can actually find exactly where they need to go and they can basically plan how that's going to be. Is that accessible from the ground? Is it going to need scaffolding? Is it something that's going to be far more uh, complex than just having a crew going out looking at it? But all that can be integrated at one time in this virtual world. So it's, it's other inspections that are also outside just what this would be, but then putting it exactly where it is in space uh, so it can quickly be, you know, basically taken care of. That's a good point because it's, it's, it's uh it's one thing to document an issue, it's another to remediate the problem and to explain to the other teams what needs to be fixed, how, to, how, how it needs to be resolved, especially in complex infrastructure. So the better job we can do locating, finding, explaining, communicating visually, uh, the more effective we'll have less change orders, less downtime, et cetera. Well, because you can basically plan your whole procedure because let's say that you have something that's 20 feet above ground, well, that's a totally different situation than having something that's at ground level. So being able to, in an office, plan essentially your, your plan of attack as to how to handle that versus having to go out and have a guy standing around or climbing up or trying to figure out, you know, where is it or how are we going to get there? At least that way it all can be planned beforehand. It's going to be much safer and more effective. So Scott gave me a call, I don't know, it was like about a year and a half ago, maybe almost, almost two years ago, mm -hmm. and said, hey, Kelly, I, I want to take a 360 camera and I want to scan inside of a tank. And I was like, ugh. I don't know if that's going to work. <laughs> but I made it clear he didn't have to go in. I had to go in. So Well, uh, yeah. and it's, it's fun because we kind of approached the problem. We stitched it. It all came together beautifully. 
And uh, we're working with a tank integrity inspection company, QI2, uh, to do a lot of their inspections now. They've implemented uh, 360 as pretty much a standard uh, to do at the pre-inspection and post-inspection. And these are the six steps that they're using the data in now. So uh, documenting the current conditions before uh, the cleaning's done. Now that data can be shared with contractors that need to estimate what needs to be done. The, the pre-inspection findings, anything from the painted uh, uh, areas and chalk marks, all of that can be visually documented. And what you'll see here on the right-hand side is the pre-inspection, on the left-hand side is the post. And obviously we could get beautiful pictures if we want to use different cameras. This is a pragmatic exercise. We're in and off this tank in 60 minutes to, to 90 minutes. So uh, the actual blue collar workers doing the inspections are just putting the camera on our hot hat or they're doing it on their uh, tripods or, or Scott's coming in to do this as part of his drone inspection outside. Or eventually the on one of these program to drive around inside the tank that will That's be right. using SLAM technology. So. That's right. So, but, but knowing the actual condition before we put fuel back in this tank, knowing that's a new floating roof, knowing the patches have been actually replaced, now we don't have to have someone out of state come to be on, the, uh, on site at the refinery. And through this process, we're told by the inspection company that the end user is saving one to two weeks in downtime. So I heard, you know, downtime was discussed in other presentations. Digital Twins are really uh, reducing that time. And at $37,000 a day of these tanks, we're talking about a quarter million dollars for capturing one other thing I, pictures. One thing I'll add also is while you're in there uh, with the 360 and after you've done, let's say, your baseline in the morning, anybody that's working in the tank can then take their iPhone, whatever they're using, you know, whatever kind of phone. They can either take pictures, they can take video, or they can make verbal annotations on their phone that can be piped directly into this deliverable. And then they, they come up as annotations in the tank. So there's a lot of interactivity with the people that are actually in the tank doing the inspections or inspecting the work that was done and then they're able to actually add that to the deliverable uh, from their phone. And, and that's the key thing about digital twins, is, is giving a digital rec replica that we can collaborate, because you know, there are different subject matter experts that have different expertise in different things. They'll look through the world as, through a different lens and be able to provide you information. So another one of our uh, big customers is um, Burns and McDonald, and we do a lot of utility work with them. And again, sometimes we'll have like 40, 50 people on a, on a webinar going through that data. So some other areas where there's some major energy loss in oil and gas, manufacturing is uh, steam traps. Uh, you may have sensors that are monitoring uh, the fail rate of steam traps. You may have a manual process to go out and test them. It's not a difficult thing, but it's a pain in the butt to do because we have lots of them. They're small, they're hard to find. And with turnover of people, uh, who precisely knows how to walk through a refinery and locate every single steam trap? You know, so be able to annotate and know where they are and build repeatable processes we'll be able to effectively create preventative maintenance uh, uh, routines that we can retain that knowledge in the cloud or in the software as opposed to once that person leaves that organization, we lose the information with that person. So another thing that we're really trying to do, we talked a little bit about drones, is, is reduce the data silos that we see with digital data. So we ingest uh, through uh, integration with Autodesk Forge any type of BIM model uh, so we do a lot of work in construction and in existing facilities, bringing in Revit, Navisworld, Trimble SketchUp, any type of uh, 3D model, but also doing terrestrial uh, laser scanning and bringing a point cloud so you have that baseline of truth to measure and understand from, whether it's captured from a drone or terrestrial, it doesn't really matter. And then really kind of starting to experiment with what kind of deliverables we get from a drone as well, whether it be ortho mosaics, point clouds, OBJ models, or doing the 360. And, Scott, what do you want to kind of give us some feedback on, on the drone flights of the 360? Yeah, one of the nice things about 360, I, I first started doing 360 about seven years ago when there was some actually Polaroid came out with some of the first ones, but you had to use multiples of the cameras on a drone. But uh, back then it was, uh, it was after some of the hurricanes we'd had in Houston and the city of Houston wanted to look at the, at the drainage ditches. And they're trying to figure out what's a quick and efficient way that we can go and inspect the drainage ditches because in Houston you've got you know couches, old cars, guys growing gardens, building you know outdoor pools, and, and they needed to know like how much of our drainage system actually can move water and how much is being obstructed. Regular video is not bad, but once you're looking at a video and you pass an object, you pretty much have to make sure that in that video you're going to see what you want and you can pause the video. But that's pretty much all you've got is just kind of this constant 2D movement through uh, through an area. Now you can, of course, stop and extract a still, but I mean the still is going to be video quality, not photograph quality. 
uh, what we learned early on with 360 was it was a totally different world because now I'm actually looking at an asset or a, uh, let's just talk about a drainage ditch. But now while I'm watching it as somebody that's looking at the deliverable, I can now move all the way around it and I can look at all sides of it. I can look where I just went in case I want to see something else. But also if I see something of interest, let's say I see an old couch that was in that drainage ditch with 360, I can actually zoom down and look at the object I'm interested in in the video, whereas 2D video, that's all you have. You can't really zoom in it unless you put it into like a light, you know, uh, some kind of a post-processing. So today you've got uh, much, much higher resolution 360 where you can actually capture even better video. You have much higher resolution to zoom in on things. And you just get a totally different perceptive when you're trying to look at large areas or even in, in smaller areas that you might not be able to get to on a ladder or rope access. You can go down with 360, but instead of having just the photographs that most inspections are, you now have something you can look at and actually virtually go all the way around it. And in some instances, you can actually combine that interior scan with the exterior scan because it all kind of plays well together. And then you can meld that all into a complete walk around inside and outside of structure. Uh, and it also is very friendly to import laser data if you need it to be extremely accurate. Um, you can use your ferro scanner or you can import LIDAR. So it's really kind of, in my opinion, it's, it's, it's a really great future technology that uh, I think you're going to see more and more of. But if you thought that video was actually very usable for drones that was really kind of groundbreaking seven years ago when it first became available, um, 360 is even that much more usable, in my opinion. You're capturing everything, right? Yeah. You're not capturing a focal point where you have overlook things. So I think that's critical. And I think when we think about digital twins, we, we have so many uh, silos within organizations that are collecting this data, recollecting this data. So whatever we can do to share this more collaboratively, uh, so those within a plant, whether you're a, you know, a line wine worker or you're, you're a project manager, whomever, uh, reusing that tool operationally is critical. But how do you do that? How do you get that data out to a, a wider group uh, within an organization? And I think really those integrations with the CMMS softwares and the other operational tools that are used in that organization are critical because you don't really want to change how people operate today. People want to operate the tools they use today. So the better we can bridge into uh, existing systems, on co construction side, it's going to be you know, Procore, Plan Grid, BIM 360. But on, uh, on the post-commissioning side for facilities, it's usually going to be a CMMS or some other type of platform. So this is a, a, a deliverable we're doing for Thai Oil right now. Traditionally, uh, the modeling, this uh, LIDAR to modeling process on this pipe rack project, you know, you'd have your PDMS model, your Naviswork, uh, and your AutoCAD as-built files would be delivered to engineering. But this new deliverable in the shaded areas is the deliverable we're giving to operations. And, and that's the exciting part, is, is to be able to share this data more operationally. So all of the BIM models, all the 360 capture, uh, all of the as-built, so all be loaded and, and accessible organizational-wide through the operations team now, as opposed to these files held hostage by certain individuals in the organization. Um, so, you know, kind of drone or terrestrial, which do you want to use? And the same question is, you know, LIDAR versus photogrammetry, which do you use? Now, again, it, it depends on the job and what your requirements are, but in a lot of cases, it's both, right? I mean, the value you get under this pipe rack from the 360 imagery or from a LIDAR data set is tr tr tremendous. The model hosts so much information, but you can see the, the drone point cloud on the right-hand side, how fast that's able to capture that data. So bringing these worlds together really gives you a little bit of everything uh, to do for different types of processes. So a project we did not so long ago with Burns & McDonald. Um, Burns is a, a big partner of ours in the utility space. We do a lot of substation um, uh, power, power gen documentation. So 24 substations documented in eight business days. You know, we had two rain days, we were, we were done early. Um, and, and what that meant was, and that was over four uh, states in, uh, in for li Liberty Power. But that documentation, we had four people from Burns and four, three people from Liberty Power out on site. Each of those people are collecting their own notes, their own photographs, and what all of that information got pushed to the digital twin. So this project's gonna be about a two-year project. How is anyone gonna remember what they saw two years ago when they get to that, that one substation, right? So be able to host all that information becomes that retention of knowledge that can be accessed at any point in time in the future. And like I said, some of our webinars we're having in, in Microsoft team meetings, sometimes like 45 people. We're having vendors in there, we're having people that had a historical uh, background on doing construction years ago in these sites. 
they had us in there because we were helping from the technology side. So really, it, it becomes this really cool experience of critical thinking and uh, good execution and good decision uh, making that happens as a result in both the design and the execution of that project. So we're going to recapture it as we uh, start to, to see construction done as well. So what it looks like, uh, this is just a little window. I obviously can't tell you where this is. This is not the Burns project. Um, but um, this is what we're getting from a, a documentation of 360 and a substation. And the ability to remove uh, ourselves from hazardous environments to be able to digitally walk through these spaces uh, for whatever purpose that is, is really valuable. Uh, we're also working on a couple construction projects right now where there's, there's new substations going up in, in Canada. Uh, and be able to host that data within the, within the um, country is something that we can do. Um, and also uh, host that data within, uh, you know, if it's Exxon or whomever, uh, they can have it hosted within their own accounts. So uh, data security is really critical and, and navigating data security is, is really important. So now the conversation getting into autonomous and, and looking at rovers and other devices. Uh, you want to share with us your little experience with this? this, with this? Uh, so this is kind of give you an idea of similar to this rover that's here, but you know, again, you know, data collection, there's a lot of different ways of doing it. Obviously, there's manually with camera cams or with tripods. Uh, obviously, there's drones we talked about. There's also terrestrial solutions. Uh, this is one that we came up with quickly to inspect a pipe. Um, it's got uh, FPV camera on board with LED lights and was able to go 200 feet inside a 36-inch drainage ditch to confirm that the drainage ditch still had its circular integrity. Uh, and also, it was able to, while we're in there, look at the, uh, the expansion of the seams of each of the pipes together. And if you look at the uh, little, little truck we have here, um, this is something that could be in a substation with GPS and could actually go in there and perform that survey by itself. So there's a lot of different ways that you can collect data now as opposed to just using human capital, but there's a lot of technological solutions as well. Yeah, and so I bring this up. We were at uh, Georgia Tech. I was teaching a, a, a their construction management program out there for the last week. And one of the, the projects we took on was to scan the Bobby Dodd Stadium that week. And that meant scanning every me mechanical room, all of their MEP, bringing in their BIM, all of the as-builts. And you know, when you look at large-scale documentation, it's tricky. You know, it, it, it takes a lot of time. So looking at various different capture methods, whether it be drone for ortho mosaics or 360, ran 360 through here. Uh, we ran the rover around a lot of the open areas. We're using tripods in the mechanical rooms. We got a, a large part, and that's a 360 camera right there showing a 360 uh, above the stadium. And we have rings around there at uh, like three or four different elevations, right? So getting that kind of high resolution from the side, the 360 does a pretty good job. But uh, you know, within a week uh, worth of data, and, and uh, we're able to create some pretty good deliverables that we can use operationally. So for the students, what they have to do next week is they have to an annotate a lot of these assets. I, I force them to take pictures of asset tags and you know, talking through all the challenges we have on really poorly documented assets and what that means operationally. And uh, so they get this exercise, and they'll deliver it by next week. And it was a pretty cool project, so I thought I'd share it with you today. But I literally haven't even gone home yet. I came uh, from, from Atlanta on Friday because uh, uh, I was invited to speak. But that's what that looks like. So operational benefits, uh, you know, it really depends on your use case. But there are some common things. The 24-7 access to site, like that is one of the most criticals. And when you have a, uh, sites that are difficult to access, dangerous to access, visual information becomes absolutely critical. And if you can remove those people from the site, not only from a safety aspect, but also from, uh, like, maybe just don't have to go there from a cost point, it's also a huge thing. Um, also, looking at uh, updating CAD information. You know, we always have this struggle with our drawings being inaccurate. Well, we can run 360 on a repetitive process. You know, some of the districts projects, we're running a daily uh, construction every Friday on a construction site. And we're able to, to look at scheduling and other things to be able to understand that on Monday we're prepared. Um, but also, you know, kind of thinking about digital twins, they, they, if you want them to be operational, you have to bring them into operational processes. And that would be a, a maintenance detail or uh, a capital asset management program or, or whatever you're using, what your tools are today. You know, I think there's a lot of ways to get there and just kind of think, well, where would we want to go and what, what opportunities does that bring? There's a lot there. Um, and also from the virtual training side, and, and I did skip a slide actually. I'm going to see if I can <laughs> sneak back to it. We're actually um, scanning uh, uh, spaces and taking training videos and yeah, tying those training cool. videos directly to the 3D space. 
And sorry, I, I don't know how I missed that one here, but I'm going to see if I can get back to it in our last couple of minutes. And I think it's this one here. Yeah, the video wasn't playing. Anyways, there's a YouTube video that's on that pool filtra fil uh, filtration, um, and basically it pops up in the software, plays a video of the process. So the guy's in there and actually does the process. So we're involved in taking those training documentations that are buried on a, on a folder and making them interactive, making them uh, you know available and have training materials more visual. And people really like to learn. Yeah, it's, it's actually really cool because you could have, essentially, you've got your, your BIM diagram down there. So it's, let's say you, you were managing a facility or you had people that were going to train in various aspects at a facility. Um, you could actually have that in your training software where they could click on maybe the room or the group of rooms or the area of the refinery or the power plant that they would be working in. And then they could actually click on each area that would be germane to what their future job was going to be. And that'll automatically take them into a training video of that room. And, uh, and that's actually what Kelly had had on here, which hopefully we could have played. But, that's what happens when but you it'll, put it on your computer. But it'll actually show a guy actually doing the training video in one of the rooms, showing all the assets that were in the room and then you know, what, what the job description was and then what would be expected and then how that job would, would happen. And so that would all be on a plan of, of, of a given workspace. So again, you can hit, oh, it's playing for some reason. There you go, there you go. <laughs> so you know, you can hit your phone with a QR code, access this information, even playing a training video on how to do something. So that information can be at your fingertips. Uh, so these processes can be brought into more of an operational and, and interactive way because people aren't reading all that documentation all the time, right? But this is a really clear way to kind of explain how to do something. So for on-site training, I mean, I'm, it, to me, I think it's revolutionary because, you know, it could be any facility that you wanted, but then you'd have site-specific training in any part of that, that facility that you'd want. And then your employees or even for retraining of old employees, it would be something that even periodically they could go in and go through refreshers, but it would show exactly what, would, what, what the procedures are and what would be expected and how to do them. I think we only got a couple minutes, so I don't know if there's a question or two, but we'd be happy to take them. In the back there? That's correct. So, you know, we, we talk to the organizations, right, and we make a, a plan, right? So, at bare minimum, a facility condition assessment is a perfect time to redo a capture. That's not really a great way to look at a digital twin because it's not current enough. Um, if we have internal people that are going to update this uh, on the maintenance team, we might be having a monthly schedule, or there may be, you know, some, some improvements that are happening. But essentially, every time you change anything within this facility, whether it be a pump, whether it be construction, you should absolutely recapture it. And you know what we're talking about is a five-minute exercise, right? But you need to be able to bring this into the operation so that people understand the value and they get the buy-in of why they're doing it. And once they start using it, I tell you, it, any customer we talk to, the moment we start using it in their environment, they just start looking at it in so many different angles. They get really hungry for the data. And they get really, uh, it, it's, a, it's a very valuable thing to understand those spaces. So again, you have to make a plan. It has to be a feasible plan. Uh, and if you can uh, pair that documentation with some type of process you're already doing, uh, then that, that makes a lot of sense. I don't know if I answered your question, but okay, yeah. great. Yeah, keeping the data current is, is you know, it's one of the, um, I know Kelly brought it up early on, but it's one of the, you know, people are kind of throwing digital twin around. It's kind of cool to talk about machine learning, ML, and AI, and it's kind of a great antidote to, you know, talk about. But the thing that a lot of people aren't realizing is, is that, you need a lot of really good data sets over time to even begin to use machine learning because that's going to be the food that machine learning feeds on that's going to be able to provide the product that AI could actually work to give you the analytics that you want from it. So if you don't have data sets over time or data sets that are correlated to each other or similar data sets from other areas all on the same kind of asset so that it can actually learn what is a corroded coating look like, what is a settling tank look like, what is a manway that, that needs to be uh, fixed, it, it, the, the system's not going to work because you just don't have enough data for, for the computer to figure out how are we going to give you some kind of proactive program or estimation on the life of something when we just don't have enough data for it. So that's an important part of this whole process of digital twins, machine learning, and then eventually AI is, is like you've got to have one before you can have the other. You can't just 
you know, because I've literally had people go, yeah, well, you know, we want to take some pictures and use machine learning to do this. And I'm like, well, if I take 20 pictures of your tank, I mean, I, we're not going to get anything out of that. I mean, we'll get you, you know, we'll stitch them all together. It'll look cool, but, you know, we're not going to have any analytics from that other than maybe what's wrong with it on that given day, but I can't extrapolate what that paint's going to look like 10 years from now. That's well said. Well said. Thank you. Yeah. I think it just, you got to look at, well, what are the processes we do? We're doing leak detection, we're doing risk assessment, we're doing all, all of these different things that require a high understanding of visualization. And it's like, okay, well, how frequent would we like the data? And can we do these processes maybe fully virtually or at least partly virtually? So I think a lot of those conversations, that would, that's what we specialize in, is really talking to the organizations and try to understand how we can kind of change a... Uh, one process and do it more efficiently this way. And that'll dictate how frequent you want to do the, the data capture. But the beautiful thing is you can capture one room or you can take five pictures or you can do the whole facility again. You can really be uh, very, very kind of strategic. Like we've gone in buildings and just do an MEP room in, a, in massive facilities. Just go knock out 30 MEP rooms. We're done in like a matter of a few days. But the value proposition there is tremendous. And we can have it in a single project, right? But the last part of that I would just add as we close is that you know, I've, I've been in the energy uh, industry for over 30 years, and one of the things that I've known from being back and trading on pipelines and whatever is maintenance is always that difficult thing, right? It's not the cool thing to spend money on. So that's another issue that I think anybody that's, that's in charge of these type projects or compliance uh, programs at any of the major corporations is, is that sometimes it's really hard to get people to look at being proactive and spending money now on collecting data, and then maybe we're going to be able to make decisions that'll save us money in the future because that's not going to move the needle. That's not going to put a few more dollars in the stock price. So, you know, we understand that there is that hurdle too out there. Um, so, anyways, anyways, I think we're at our time. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank for you very much. And we'll be around outside if anybody else has any more questions. Yeah.